Thank you everyone for joining us. This is kind of an annual thing where we take a look at the past fiscal year. We're looking at fiscal year 2020 of glider accidents and what's involved with that. Uh, tonight, we have most of the New England Fast Team plus a Wings Pro with us. We're gonna look at accidents, incidents, some trends. We're also gonna take a look at information that you can't get off of the NTSB website. Uh, this is one of the things is, as the FAST team program manager, I have some insight to the FAA stuff and I what I can share with you, I am gonna share with you. So hopefully give you a little bit more information here. So quick kind of startup type of things is, this is the New England FAST team, all of us with here tonight. Uh, Dan Carter, operations from Bradley, Rob Leonard, is airworthiness from Bradley. You guys want to say hello so people know your voices? Sure. Uh, hi, this is Dan Carter from uh, Farmington, Connecticut tonight, and uh, happy to be here. Looking forward to this glider presentation. Uh, learn some stuff about glider safety. Yes, and Rob Leonard from, um, I live down in Niantic, Connecticut, and it's good to be here with you guys uh, learning about uh, gliders. And then off on the right-hand side is John Wood and I. We are the operations uh, fast team program managers for the Portland, Maine office. That's John in the back, me in the front uh, for the Boston FISDO. You want to say hello, John, so people know, can hear your voice? Sure, you bet, Steve. Hi, I'm John Wood. I'm the fast team program manager for the Portland FISDO. And uh, welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us tonight. Yeah, and that's us flying in an aircraft that probably could be used as a tow plane and is used as a tow plane by some clubs. Also joining us tonight, I don't know if he's going to be able to say hi here quick because he literally is. He's a lucky guy. He was flying today uh, when all of us were working on our computers. But Dave Strasberg, who's a um, safety rep and has won some awards for being a safety rep also. Also a Wings Pro, also a Glider CFI. Dave and I have flown together. Dan and Dave have flown together. And he's going to help provide us with some of the insights on the accidents that we take a look at tonight. I don't know. He might jump in just a slide or two later. But if you're there, Dave, say hello quick. I'm here. I just got done with a beautiful day of flying. If you're a glider pilot in Georgia, you had a really nice day today. Um, as I sent Steve some pictures to, uh, yes. to torture him as he was working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting away my 24,000 uh, pound tow plane right now and I'm um, happy to be here tonight. Okay, terrific. So he'll, he'll be back with us in a minute as he's just finishing the last little stuff in the hangar. Uh, I think he is actually doing this from the hangar tonight um, with it. But just a few things people always ask, Wings Credit, we'll get those uploaded in just a few days. This webinar, along with most others, we usually put up on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. It's still up there right now. You can find the same presentation from the fiscal year 2019 that we did last April. Uh, it is up there right now. In about a week, you'll probably see this. And like I said, we're going to break it into two parts. There's just so much information out there. So the other one will follow along. There's also some things you can go on fasafety.gov. There's some courses. Uh, a couple of them are associated with gliding. There's this one for gliding for the airplane pilot. Uh, there's also another one that's called, oh no, I'm landing out. And on your tabs here, uh, you do have the ability for some handouts and I got three of them there. I have one is a glider wings pamphlet that I use that covers both knowledge and flight portions. From Dave, it's uh, glider kind of quick wings for the instructor that you can take with you when you're flying to do the flight portion of the wings program in the glider. And then I have the notes, which is the largest thing for the slides tonight. And like I said, we're breaking it into two, but I've included all the slides um, for the tow accidents and the motor glider accidents too. Hoping you can join us for that one, but I want you to at least have the basic information. If you haven't been on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel, I would encourage you to go there. Uh, we have lots of interesting things. We tried a little test, which we'll be doing some more things like it in the near future, but there's the glider accident that never happened. Uh, where myself and uh, Buddy go finding a glider wing off in the woods of New Hampshire that has been left there for years. We'll 
this spring we'll be doing a follow-up to that because we've learned more information since then. This will be on there. Many other things are on there. And what we want to do is always ask us, our safety reps, you, this is what glider clubs are about, is promoting, educating, and improving aviation. And the most important thing is, are you being a proficient pilot? We'll talk about it some more, but it is important. It is so, so important to do annual proficiency checking, uh, no matter what type of flying that you do. And if you move between the professional flying, uh, the airliners down to the gliders, you probably want to be doing proficiency checks in both because they are vastly different aircraft. For a proficiency program, if you're not familiar, we with the FAA have the WINGS program, which is available. It's on faasafety.gov. And there's also the WINGS pros, which Dave is one of them, uh, actually for both the Boston and the Bradley FISDO, because he kind of crosses uh, the FISDO borders, lives close to them. Um, but the Wings Pros are the type of person that can sit down with you and help you get started in the Wings program and help you get set up with your account. And if you just go on FAAsafety.gov where you see the picture of that helicopter, Dave was just telling me, it's scrolling through and you'll see a thing on Wings Pro. You click on it, it'll open up a spreadsheet for you. So it's real easy to find the Wings Pro in your area. And I do want to thank you for joining us tonight for what is part one of being a proficient pilot, and that's the knowledge side of it. And in the WINGS program, there's three credits required to achieve a level of WINGS, um, one, two, and three, as you can see there, covering those topics. But what we all do need is part two, which is the flight proficiency, the exercise, the moving the stick side to it. And for gliders, the three flight credits that are required cover these topics. And last but not least, it is available again this year with the WINGS program is $10,000 WING sweepstakes. Not a single prize of $10,000, but multiple prizes that equate up to $10,000. And if you achieve a level of WINGS, you automatically get entered in the sweepstakes. As an instructor, if you do wings for a student, you also get um, sweepstakes entry for that. And I know we had in the Boston area, one of our assistant chief flight instructors at one of the schools, uh, surprisingly won the prize. Vicki Quo from Horizon Aviation, really psyched about that, paid for her, uh, some of her proficiency flying with what she won. And I think someone in Connecticut won too, Dan, is that correct? Uh, yeah, actually, I think, uh, hey, Dave, are you on? Uh, I believe it was someone up at Northampton. Is that correct? Was it? Yeah, yeah, somebody at Northampton that actually just became a commercial glider pilot and a glider instructor within the past year or so to renew his CFI. So a grand prize winner, $1,500. <laughs> it was a real nice surprise. Hey, <laughs> paid for, if not all, at least a lot of his training then. Terrific. Absolutely terrific. Uh, since they're a pilot, they can invest that money until it's all gone. <laughs> well, yes, we all know that all too well. But hey, just a little disclaimer here is what we're trying to do. This is kind of oriented towards the flight instructors and the professional pilots, but it's useful for everybody. And what we're really trying to do is provide future discussion material between the instructors and the pilots at your club and all of that. We're not here to speculate. Everything you're going to see is basically either from the NTSB database and some of it is from what we have in FAA records and I'll point that out to you when we hit it. It's almost all public information, just a little bit is the little bit extra that I'm allowed to share as an FPM uh, with it. And, you know, we try to make it as accurate as possible at the time that we're reporting this, but there always may be some errors. And why are we doing this? It's because people like Dave and I and all of you and all of us like to get out there and fly, uh, even when it is chilly and cold, even in gliders, but to help us all learn, you know, and understand that we all are capable of having an accident. We don't want it to happen. We want to learn how to avoid it, but we are human and we can all make mistakes, you know, uh, and we want to do our best to avoid that provide us some insights for teaching, recurrent training. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, you know, take 
things away from tonight and use it in the recurrent training that you're doing with the pilots in your club that you fly with, whatever. And last but not least, to remind us as pilots in terms of our tasking when we're flying, what is important? What do we need to focus on to keep ourselves safe? So I do have a couple poll questions here uh, for this evening, just to give us a little bit of insight for you, who our audience is and uh, to give you some insight to it. Right now, just so you know, we're passing 425 attendees and I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you, uh, Rob. You're gonna handle the polls for us, I think, tonight. Very good, Steve. Here we go. We're launching the first poll. Um, question is, I know someone that was involved in a glider or tow plane accident. Uh, yes or no? We've got 59% uh, voted, 70%, 80%, 80 83% voted, 86%. We're really doing good tonight. 86% voted, 87. Looks like we're holding at 87%. I'm gonna close it and show the results. So it looks like 66% are aware of somebody that uh, was in a glider tow plane accident and 34% no. So Steve, is it all right if I launch the second question now? Yes, please do, please do. All right. Second question is, I have the following glider credentials. CFIG, private or greater glider rating, silver badge or greater, tow pilot, student or other type of pilot not yet rated in gliders. Okay, we got 50, 65%, 72% voted, 83%, 86, 87. We're getting a little bit higher in this question. We're <laughs> over 90%. Excellent. Good. I'm going to wait another couple of seconds. And it looks like we're good. We're leveling off at 91%. Can close it and share the results. Okay. Terrific. Like I said, tonight we are going to try to focus on that stuff, on this material towards the CFI, but it's great stuff for even the private pilots out there, even the students, and especially to the tow pilots to think about what you can do to help, you know, enjoy, have fun, but be a safe pilot. All right. So thank you very, very much, Rob. That that definitely helps. That helps us see and know who we have out there with us um, in the evening, out there with us <laughs> on the webinar this evening. Now, some of the insights is this program, I tend to do it in around April. That's what I target for, even though it is covering fiscal year 2020, which for the FAA is from October 1, 2019 to the end of September uh, 2020. I do wait a few months because we got to get some of the data in and all of that. But what it really is targeted at is to help supplement the Soaring Safety Foundation. They do a terrific job with their annual report, have been doing it for years, uh, and you almost always will see the executive summary in the April issue. I just spoke with one of the members today. That is the plan again this year. The full annual report will be posted on their website soon. I checked yesterday, it wasn't, but you know, the classic, it could be any day now. I do want to emphasize one of the things they ask, and it'll come up with what we're looking at a little bit later on, but they do ask the Soaring Society of America and Soaring Safety Foundation to participate in the launch and flight time database uh, with your club. It helps us know that's the Soaring Safety Foundation and the SSA know what's going on out there with the um, amount of flying and gliders. And last but not least, what I do is I look at this as a supplement is the Soaring Safety Foundation does a terrific, terrific job at showing you the forest, the trends, the long-term trends of glider safety, what is important to be paying attention to. 
What I try to do is each year take you down to look at some of the trees that make up the forest here to show you what happened, why it happened. You'll hear some terms, you know, accident, FA and NTSB share the same term. There occasionally is a serious incident, which is an NTSB term. The FA, we use the word incident a lot. <laughs> There are some occurrences in the FAA that's a lower tier level that may have an impact on safety. An incident is something that does. If we don't know what to call it yet, we in the FAA call it an event to get started. Is we don't, if we don't know what it is, what impact it may have on safety, we just say an event. Most of the information here came from uh, the NTSB, their new Carroll uh, research system, and also their document management system. Uh, terrific. And then a whole lot of FAA data systems, and even more than are listed here. <laughs> you know, some of this stuff I dug down pretty deep, and we got a lot of new data systems too uh, out there. I know I dug through the DMS system, I've dug through IACRA, I've done, dug through. Uh, EIS uh, Bravo, I've dug through the accident incident database, I've dug through a ACES, uh, you name it, I've, I've done a lot of digging to bring you this information here. And one of the things that we do in the FAA is we do have an annual general aviation survey for the amount of flying that goes on. And 2011, we kind of messed it up. <laughs> so I start at 2012. 2011 is a year that it's all estimates. It, it's not based upon anything. But, you know, the survey is sent out. Um, you know, I don't know if they know that I work for them or not, but boy, they've hit me just about every year since I bought my glider to ask me how much I fly it and all that other stuff. And I do participate because it helps all of us, including you, know what's going on. But here's the number of hours flown uh, in the glider fleet since 2012. You can see it's probably a bit of a trending down system. There are some variations in this, of course. Probably not a giant surprise to people, but we're seeing this trend also down in the size of the glider fleet. This is the number of active aircraft they believe registered based upon that survey. 2013, um, you'll see the significant drop in it, and that's because that was kind of the final year of the new re-registration rule. So there definitely were some people that missed that, um, you know, and were like, oops, I need to re-register and, and didn't know. So they were dropped off of the list. And according to that survey, for each of the years, this is the average number of hours per aircraft uh, in the glider fleet as it has been flown. These numbers will be used for a little bit, um, little bit more information here you'll take a look at. But before we dig in deep into 2020, I do want to do a quick update from the prior years just to let you know of things you may want to be looking for on the NTSB website. Um, you know, if you've joined us in the past years, these are the accidents or incidents, accidents actually, that are still hanging out there that um, have not finished or recently the investigations have been finished on. And I'm going to go through quick, but we have this one here. Uh, out west with the Arcus M motor glider is still preliminary in Richfield, Utah from June 2018. Another motor glider, Peepestrel, uh, touring motor glider from West Palm Beach in August of 2018 is still preliminary. Uh, Nevada accident in the Duo Discus motor glider is still preliminary from September 2018. Groveland, Florida, uh, preliminary, instructional in a Grove Twinist steer. Uh, you know, non-fatal, but injuries um, with that. And that's still outstanding for 2018. For 2019, here are either the changes <laughs> or what's still outstanding. This 233 accident in Blairstown, New Jersey has been, had the final published. And just quickly, the probable cause that they came up with on that accident is 
improper landing flare and the flight instructor's delayed remedial action, which resulted in a hard landing, and the instructor sustaining a serious injury. Uh, that's not good. You know, don't want that to happen to anybody. Right here in my backyard, uh, this Peepestral motor glider is still preliminary. This one should be coming out soon as a final. It is what is called factual. So we don't have a probable cause on it yet, but it should come out soon. Uh, this accident in Grove Twinisteer in Brandon, Mississippi, I think this was a cross country tow oriented one. Uh, Sparks, Nevada, this was a launching accident, if I recall, in the Deanna 2. This is now final. This is the probable cause with it, hitting the sagebrush. That was the results of that accident. Oregon, this is still preliminary. I believe this was a um, auto tow accident, if I do recall correctly, with a fairly uh, new pilot, was a fatal accident. New pilot to the aircraft, if I recall. This one, uh, associated with a competition in Texas, is factual. I would encourage you to maybe go take a look at that one. There's some interesting things determined um, in that accident already. And it'll be interesting to see when the probable cause comes out. Robertsdale, Alabama in August 2019. Uh, is still preliminary. And then DG uh, 300 in Wilkeson, uh, Washington from August 2019, still preliminary. This tow plane accident is also still preliminary. Now, it's not always the case, but accidents that take longer to have the final report issued, many times there's something significant being discovered in the following in the follow-up to the accident investigation uh you know and you do want to take a look at that you know it might be something about the aircraft it might be something about the pilot so i highlight to you these and if you did download the handout, you'll have the NTSB numbers, the dates, the end numbers. You can go find them on the NTSB.gov, their Carroll search engine fairly easily, and maybe take a look at them and keep track because there's a lot of very, very interesting things that will come up on that. So as I mentioned, we're gonna take a look at fiscal year 2020. That's what that covers. And I'm gonna give you some insight to some stuff that we in the FAA are the ones that get to take a look at. Uh, if you're outside of the FAA, not a safety rep, uh, you may not see this. Even the safety reps, the, they'll only get this sort of information if it is um, given to them by the um, FPMs, and I apologize, I'm just correcting because I turned off a system. I got the little um, banner bar showing up down at the bottom all the time on my computer, so I do apologize, but I'm trying to get rid of it for us all. <laughs> Yeah, I know I can't log into that right now. The way it always does go, I just can see that that was showing up. So I'm trying to get it out of the way for you. So we take a look at what's known as an emergency operations network. This is what Washington keeps an eye on for accident incidents, delays in the program or whatever. But we have what's known as a daily report application that tells us what's going on feed us information. I look at this for gliders on a weekly basis. We don't see many things, but I use the keyword glider. And if I look back at 2020, we ended up having a total of 52 different reports that showed up in this emergency operations network uh, that had glider. Now, if I take out things that are hang gliders, paragliders, stuff like that, it breaks us down to just 35 reports, and some of those are the accidents that you'll hear about here tonight. But, uh, you know, it is interesting to note when you look at this, these may be occurrences, incidents, accidents, 
you know, we had a couple events that did definitely include tow planes. We had events that definitely included motor gliders, and this is above and beyond just the accidents. If you take a look at what sort of things come across this, uh, this is what we had for those occurrences on the emergency operations network. We had six fatal accidents. We had 17 accidents or incidents. It doesn't break out. You know, four occurrences. Believe it or not, we actually had a laser event, including gliders, and we'll take a look at that a little bit later on. Uh, near mid-air collision, pilot deviations. Uh, yeah, it is. And you see some interesting things, you know. Uh, we had somebody, I don't know who, where, what, when exactly, that's long past gone, but, you know, got hit with a large blue laser uh, while flying a glider. You know, glider out flying and didn't assess the amount of smoke in the air, pilot had no radio, and ended up landing at a tower-controlled airport with tower visibility only two miles with smoke due to the forest fires. You know, we had bad forest fires out west last year. Pilot deviation when unknown glider and tow aircraft entered class Delta airspace together without contacting ATC. We have some other records, uh, what we will call PTRS activity records, some other things. And I look at that too. Uh, a lot of these, I'm looking at the notes that are occurring with it and here's some of the things that we found there what is interesting which is great um, we the FAA are getting out to a lot of the accidents for on-site investigations um, when it's actually an accident in and of itself occasionally for various reasons we will have to do it off-site um, the incidents you know where it's just bending or breaking an airplane but nobody hurt and it's not major damage uh, a lot of those will do off-site just say to the person hey send us pictures you know let us know what's going on but what is interesting is to see um you know the complaints i have zero with the asterisk i i removed any there just because it was really hard to determine if any of them were actual gliders um with it and then um, near mid-air collision reports. Uh, we had eight of them that did involve gliders. What is interesting to me, and it kind of makes me go, hmm, a little bit, <laughs> and, and Rob can probably even go, huh, is seven out of those eight near mid-air collision reports were assigned to maintenance or avionics inspectors to investigate. You know, how often did that happen to you, Rob, when you were working the line? Never. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's that's why that almost always goes to an operations inspector. So it, it really puzzled me to see that, you know, these this past year, uh, wherever they were occurring, were being uh, investigated by a maintenance inspector. So, you know, maybe it's one of those type of things. Not that any of us want that call. Uh, but if it does, and hi, I'm from the FAA and I'm here to help you, you might want to ask what type of uh, background or what type of inspector you're working with. <laughs> you know, if you're dealing with a near mid-air collision one, I might say, hey, could we get an ops inspector on with us too, somebody? <laughs> or, or vice versa, you know, if you're dealing with engine stuff, you know, you don't want to necessarily be talking to... Um, an ops inspector, you really want to talk to somebody that knows about it, right, Rob? <laughs> yeah, it's right, Steve. Yeah, yeah. So here I take just some of the comments to see, you know, that see glider self-reported a near mid-air collision. Uh, this was a common theme that started to occur this year. No site visit by the FA or NTSB to, due to COVID-19. Here is one, uh, advise the airport operations manager or safety concern about potential obstruction of the taxi visibility created by the presence of a large glider trailer parked between the parallel taxiways and conversion taxiways. Why did they advise that? Because two turboprop aircraft collided taxiing right beside the glider um, trailer. It's, that was the claim is one of them didn't see the other one until it was too late because of the glider trailer parked between the two taxiways. 
some other things, you know, this one I probably relates to what we saw, but being towed behind a tow plane during a flight review in the glider and in the class D airspace without prior radio communication. Um, this happens, indicated the aircraft initially stopped at the hold short line for runway 11, but then proceeded across the hold short line without ATC authorization. Yeah, we can have, you know, runway incursions uh, with gliders and motor gliders. And that's what we end up happening. And, you know, and here's one where tow pilot uh, probably was an incident. I didn't see anything, but they ended up when trying to drop the rope and then land, ended up hitting the nose hard on the tow plane. With NASA, we also have the Aviation Safety Reporting System. We had 16 reports dealing with gliders. It's classically what's known as the NASA form, and you find out a lot more information uh, about this in this advisory circular. And now, one of the better ways to submit the reports is electronically, which you can do online. And ATC, maintenance, cabin crew, pilots, ground crew, anyone basically, if they see a safety issue coming up, um, can put one of these in. It's mostly a comment type of system. I will note, you know, the Soaring Safety Foundation has a similar system that is glider specific and oriented towards their scenario training database. Um, you know, and you can go to this website right there for the Soaring Safety Foundation. It, that is something that will help all of us in the glider clubs with it. For those reports, here's what we had. And this is where we really start to see the challenge of flying gliders and how other pilots may perceive what we're doing and end up reporting near midair collisions with it. Um, these were the issues that came up on those 16 reports, not very many this year, but here's some of the comments. You know, that was actually a near midair collision between the glider itself and the tow plane, um, you know, as the tow plane turned right after release when the pilot was expecting it to turn left and then he continued to turn right back at. You know, this one was from ATC. They're actually recommending their airport be class B or class C extension to protect, to keep the glider activity out or away from the airport. You know, one poor person had to talk to his gliding buddies and basically say, hey, I was just on with air traffic control and they're telling me that some of you guys are up there violating class A airspace, you might wanna get down. You know, don't, that poor guy happened to be the bearer of bad news. You know, here was one is, um, two people actually challenged by an abnormal situation in the um, aircraft and decided to divert to another airport and then were challenged because they found a glider being towed on the runway going, you know, taking up the runway, but there was nobody listening to or talking on the CTAF, although they had tried, you know. Another statement that you see here, just saying, hey, radios might help some. Rear canopy, can't emphasize it enough, but this was a student um, who had the rear canopy in the two seat flying solo pop open because he had stopped for a little bit and his instructor went to get something out of it and it was not completely closed properly and popped open, I think, during the takeoff roll. Um, passenger scared by a near midair collision by a glider. And this is the point where I really would emphasize to the instructors, you wanna start taking some notes. You know, this is the time to get out the pen and paper. Uh, and if you're not an instructor, you probably still wanna get out the pen and paper because you can use this for your own refresher recurrent training. If we look at the major issues that we saw in the accidents, um, in fiscal year 2020 is what you'll find is a lot of them, most of them, if not, are associated with landing setup pattern, low final, uh, basically, you know, trying to stretch to the airport. And maybe with that, 
having a stall spin accident. We've had a few of those um, before. And um, again, I apologize. I see this keep popping up and I'm trying to get rid of it on the screen. Premature termination of toe and departure, planning and execution. Um, you know, when things start to go wrong, not necessarily being ready to do the right thing. Outlandings, collision with obstacles, you know, field selection, that sort of thing, always with it. Uh, but also with outlandings, I would emphasize the failure to plan and do an outlanding is every year we have a couple accidents of people that just kind of lock up, think they're going to make it to the next airport or make it back to their home airport or whatever, and end up in the trees or something uh, short of the airport. Just not good. Hard landings, uh, we see this across the board in all fixed wing aircraft, right? Uh, Dan, John, do you guys deal with hard landings at all in airplanes? Oh, good. Yes, yeah, Steve, we do the accident analysis every year, and they're they're all over the place in there. Seaplanes, too. I mean, glassy water, you know, smashing it on. Yeah, it does happen. Yep. Yeah. We call it uh, when the pilots get their landing currency all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and then some. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, last, it, it does, we see a lot of these are the fatal ones, the loss of control or collision when they're out flying somewhere for unknown reasons, um, you know, out doing the cross country, this has a high fatality uh, rate to it. You know, and I would emphasize here, one area I would pay particular attention to with this is ridge soaring. Um, we tend to see this in mountainous areas. We tend to see it where maybe the person uh, was flying close to the ridge, caught a wingtip or something like that it appears to us, or ridge soaring with a motor glider. We've ended up having a few accidents over the years where, you know, when you're ridge soaring, you really don't have much time, altitude or anything to play with to get the engine out to restart and fly away. And we end up having circumstances there with that. So if we take a look at the accidents, we'll cover some charts, but just so you know, um with it what we end up having and i don't know why i have 17 total that's a, that's an incorrect statement um, there but we had 13 accidents in pure gliders eight accidents in um motor gliders and four of them in tow planes now the ntsb did not necessarily catch all of them they did qualify some motor glider accidents as um, airplane accidents and that sort of thing. But if you take a look over the past 10 years, here's according to the NTSB going off of the glider category, the trend of the number of accidents. Um, it is hard to judge just because it bounces up and down. Last year, we had a pretty good year. Fiscal year 2020, we're dealing with COVID. Uh, so we probably had less flying, but ended up having a few more accidents. That may not necessarily be so good. And if you are curious, this is a little bit of a bitter pill for all of us to swallow, but it's being done the same way. This is the comparison of our accident rate in gliders with the rest of the fixed wing world is, yeah, what we do is risky. This is... Um, you know, the number of accidents based upon the FAA General Aviation Survey for taking the number of NTSB accidents and cross-referencing it with the number of hours flown. And what you're looking at, it does appear using the same qualifiers that our accident rate in gliders is anywhere in the neighborhood of four to five times greater than non-commercial fixed wing flying. Correspondingly, it's the same thing for our fatal accident rate. It's approximately four to five times greater than the non-commercial fixed wing flying. 
i.e. our fatal rate ends up being pretty darn close over the years to the total accident rate of non-commercial fixed wing. Now, many of people will argue on this, well, you know, number of hours isn't known so well, accidents or whatever. Yeah, that's true, but you definitely can tell over the years that we definitely are having more accidents with it. And there's no doubt about it. What we do is risky. Many have written about it. We've all seen articles in Soaring Magazine, you know, blogs like Chess in the Air, Soaring Economist, Wings and Wheels on their weekly stuff. It, it definitely is the case. And that's something, you know, we need to think about and maybe think about how it is that we're going to help sustain soaring as a terrific sport and bring more people into it is I, I do think it's one of the things we need to probably focus on is getting that accident rate down. If you take a look at the months, uh, last year we were very concentrated. It's a little bit spread out over fiscal year 2020. I will note a couple things is there were two motor glider accidents in April that the NTSB listed as airplanes. So add a couple more there. And then if we look at tow planes, these were the months that we ended up having the tow plane accidents. We had four of them that I'm aware of able to dig out. Phase of flight, just so you know, classically landing is the most common. And then if we look at fiscal year 2020, uh, for the injury levels, you can see that. I've highlighted, added in those couple motor glider ones. Uh, so you see the 7247, uh, one still is listed as unknown because has been much has not been done on the accident investigation. And if you are curious, worked kind of hard on this over the last few years, but we now have the capability to look at the accidents, where they occurred and the number of them. This is for fiscal year 2020. I will admit, Note, Tennessee is missing off of this map because of an error uh, in the NTSB database. So there should be an accident in Tennessee, but this gives you an idea of where the accidents occurred. And this little bar over here on the side tells you the states that the pilots were domiciled in. We have that capability now. Classically, most people fly gliders in the same state that or close by. Uh, to the state they live in. Rarely do we have people flying elsewhere unless it's like at a competition uh, like the seniors or, or, you know, 126 championship, whatever it may be. This is always an interesting thing. This is just a plot diagram of the pilot age versus the months since review. We do advocate um, for doing a proficiency check, flight review, every 12 calendar months, i.e. would advocate too for the WINGS program. So if we draw in that 12 month line, you'll see, you know, where we stand and think about how many accidents we might be able to take away from the total if we had everybody doing um, 12 month proficiency recurrency checks. Yes, we do occasionally have and maybe even some of these may be this because we don't know. They either haven't told us or can't tell us, but we do have some people that do not have a flight review and end up getting involved in an accident. Not necessarily a good thing. Also, what is interesting, but a lot of these accidents down here, not all of them, but usually a fair number of them are people that are brand new, just got their certificate or rating in a glider. And we definitely have like four or five accidents that fall into that realm right down there, or student pilots for that matter. You know, and I, I really do encourage, I, I'm getting there myself, never thought I would, but I am thankfully. <laughs> Retirement age, if you've reached the age to be able to retire, I think it's really, really important that you do a review every year on your flight proficiency. It will help you out, it'll help out your club, it'll help out your insurance company, you know, to assure yourself that you're a safe and capable pilot. So I strongly do encourage that. Here's another big kicker uh, for the glider community. 
And this is something I think we need to come into grips with because just even the number of airframes, this is time and type for our accidents, cross-reference to our age. And I pay attention down here, the 25 hours or less, look at all of those accidents that were people 25 hours or less. We're losing upwards of 10 airframes a year, folks, um, to glider accidents with people that just purchased the glider and are crashing them. You know, I cannot emphasize enough, we get so many accidents with people that have less than 25 hours of type. As a result, I would personally recommend, you know, if you buy a new glider, do your best to get 25 hours in it right in the local area. Don't start going off to places. Don't try going far, that sort of thing. Get to know the glider and get some training on it and get help repeatedly rigging it. Um, you know, having somebody check, doing positive control checks. You know, really the insurance companies are paying a lot of claims out there on these newly purchased gliders. You'll see a few people listed up there with over a hundred hours, just so you know. Um, you know, we had two, one person with 295 in type, the highest was just over a thousand, um, that sort of thing. We do have some people high time in type that have accidents, but by far most of them are fairly new to the glider you know, stepping up to their first glass ship or higher performance glider and don't realize the impact maybe that sinking air may have on their glide performance in that glider. Have you seen anything like this, Dave, that kind of catches your attention? Yeah, uh, definitely want to get that time in it and kind of think about changing your minimums as you go along. You may be not challenging the weather quite as much as you would in a in a ship that you're more familiar with and stuff. I wanted to mention one other question too. A question as you were talking about wings and a flight review. Um, uh, it's sometimes if you've got to pull out your logbook and stuff like that, it might be hard to know exactly when it's coming up or keeping a close eye on it. But one of the things that wings actually does if you do your flight reviews through that is it actually tracks it, and it's real easy to see and know exactly when it's due. So that you don't want to have um, you know, someone else asking you that question when they're filling out paperwork. You definitely want to know at all times what your status is and uh, really can help you keep an eye on that and exactly uh, how often you are flying and how often you need to do that. Yeah, that's a terrific point. And, you know, as I've said before, before we started, you know, you have any terrific information like that, please jump right in, um, you know, to help out because that is very, very good information. And we're not going to cover it tonight, but there is an accident associated with a tow plane that really, I think, would give a lot of clubs concern with how the accident came about and the qualifications of the pilot. And that's something, you know, to assure is you don't want to be at a club that ends up having an accident and finding out that the pilot did not meet the flight review requirements, maybe was not appropriately rated or endorsed or whatever else it may be. So, you know, it can happen to all of us. You know, we could skip, oops, I didn't realize that was due last month type of thing. So any little reminder like that is helpful. The NTSB doesn't necessarily do this, but we have the capability within the FAA when we look at our accident investigations, and this is the general trend, is this is the primary accident causal factor uh, for glider accidents. You know, each of us look at it within our own FISDOs, uh, but this is for gliders across the country, and of notice pilot-induced error, how big it is. And then even some of the others, <laughs> you'll see, you know, stall spin, loss of control, hit known object. You probably could see how they could be related. But on any given accident, uh, the investigating inspector is only allowed to choose one primary causal factor. And so many of our accidents in gliders, motor gliders, and I include the four tow planes in this also, um, can be there. And that may equate, or maybe not, to the loss of power. That could be a motor glider. 
They also have the ability, they can choose anywhere from zero to, you know, 25 plus or whatever of contributing accident factors. And this is very interesting there. You know, loss of control is very significant. Hard landing, which we've already brought up, is very significant. You know, stall spin, significant. That, that can be dangerous at low altitudes. We all know that. Undershot the runway, of course, that's dangerous. Mismanaging the controls, all of this. But that gives you some insight as to what we're seeing. And last but not least, again, you don't see this with the NTSB, but it is what we're tasked with doing on any accident that we investigate in our offices is the FAA is assigned what are known by Congress. It's nine areas of responsibility in aircraft accidents. And we look to see if any of these have an impact on the accidents that we do end up seeing. You know, and guess what is because of the pilot induced error, by far we see airman competency is huge, huge there. And, you know, John and Dan, if you see airman competency on our accident report, what do you usually see going to the pilot after? Right. What's up? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, a letter, I, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you know be a letter. Um, yeah, that, go ahead, John. Yeah, you no, know, Steve. You know, if it's a competency issue, you know, you're you're looking at the pilots, looking at a possible 709 re-exam. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? I, uh, you know, I love soaring just as much as the rest of you, and I, I gotta bring this out there because I, I see it from both sides. But in the glider world, we're probably a much older population. We see it in the airplane world too, within our FISDOs. But boy, you know, we have a lot of people that, you know, end up having a boo-boo like this. It gets put down to airman competency. They get asked to do a 709 ride, uh, you know, which is well within the FAA's rights. We we don't need to get into that debate. You can go to AOPA and others and ask them about it. I, anytime I do a 709 ride, the first thing I do is I send them about four AOPA articles, you know, on how to prepare for it, whatever. But we probably have a lot of people that end up just giving up and not flying again. And that's not a good thing for us in the soaring community. You know, that's why I think we as instructors, myself included, you know, the clubs, the sport need to assure that the glider pilots that are out there and flying are competent, not having accidents, are competent airmen, you know, and are able to do that is we don't want to, you know, make it any more challenging or more difficult on it. Dave, you deal with this, and Dave and Dan, you guys work together on this. One of the things I would ask all the clubs out there is look at getting a safety rep in your club if you don't have one already. Uh, because if you do have somebody in your club that has a boo-boo, you're much, much better off having the safety rep and that person engage and work together and maybe get started on some remedial training, some counseling and stuff like that right from the get-go is what does happen is, you know, I, I know Dave, you've dealt with this a few times, but you know, that happens, you'll start doing some remedial training with somebody. They'll say, yeah, we're thinking about doing a 709. Well, he's been doing this, you know, and he's doing well and so forth. Oh, really? Terrific. Well, keep me up to date and let me know, you know, when you're done and make sure that he's up to standards and all of this. And we end up avoiding the 709s quite often in that case, right? Yeah, um, I've, def I've definitely found that, Stephen, that, uh, you know, we try to be as proactive as we can be. Uh, many of the clubs that I work with have really worked hard to kind of get out in front of this. You know, currency is is an absolute minimum, you know, like, you know, flying VFR with mauve visibility and clear clouds. I mean, we, we're we not looking for minimums. We're looking to go out and fly. As instructors, um, we need to set examples by flying with each other. 
Um, there's a lot of times there's the feeling like, uh, you know, you get your instructor and your rating and you've, you've gone to the top of the mountain or whatever. Um, but you need to get out there and practice those skills yourself as a pilot instead of, uh, you know, observing all the time. So uh, get out there, be an example, work on those things together. And, and you can document these things. What I've found is, um, uh, you know, renewing my flight instructor certificate, I, I pretty much can renew at any time just by working with wings and documenting the training and working with my my students and the pilots that I work with and getting them involved in it. So if, you know, if heaven forbid I should ever have an incident or something like that, I've got a nice long track record of all the things that I've done along the way uh, that can show I was doing my best to try, you know, to try to stay proficient. I wasn't just trying to meet the minimum requirement. Hey, Steven, this is Dan. Do you care if I jump in here? No, please do, please uh, do. <laughs> yeah, so I think we've, uh, We've successfully uh, put like about a half a dozen pilots through the last year for remedial training, and um, you know I'm a I'm a big fan of it when it's appropriate. I think it's a it's a fantastic tool, um, and you know uh, don't take my word for it. Just do a little uh, little uh, internet search, and we've been getting some really good uh, write ups and articles and press on on the remedial training. And there's been a kind of a fundamental shift to try to use that when it's appropriate, and uh, which covers it. A lot of the cases, and I know Dave is, uh, has helped out quite a bit with those. Um, we we had some challenges, you know, the past year with with COVID doing the training, but um, we found some ways to work around that. But yeah, it's definitely something that uh, we we try to do as much as we can. Yeah, if you got a good instructor that's safety conscious in your club, if they're not already a safety rep, you know, talk to your local uh, FPM people like John, Dan, and I. Um, to you about getting them as a safety rep and, you know, be willing to engage like Dave has. Um, you know, it, it really is. We use Dave and Dan internally as a good example because they've done a lot of positive things for a lot of flight schools and even a few glider clubs uh, around New England with it where we really have been able to take away the, the stigma associated with 709s because we've been able to engage on remedial training right away with it which is awesome and the great thing about the remedial training is you know at the end uh you get a pilot who's trained uh hopefully they know more um you know about the fast team and, and, and the reps we have and you know at, at the end of the day we have a safer pilot and they get a letter that says you know hey this this matter's been closed so you know happy pilot uh safer pi safer you know so it's just a it's a win-win and we can use it yes yeah, definitely is. So let's take a look at the pure glider accidents that we ended up uh, seeing here in fiscal year uh, 2020. These are um, gonna go in date order and it's gonna be just the pure gliders for this evening. But the first one, Mariana, Arizona, this is the NTSB number, it's preliminary. Part 91 personal is what it's labeled as, but it was kind of an instructional flight. This is one of those things that you kind of look at and go, hmm, interesting. Uh, DG500, that was the end number. It was non-fatal, two people on board, one minor injury. Uh, the FAA did investigate on scene. The NTSB did not. Some pilot info and added info. It had two pilots. As had said, it was kind of pseudo instruction. It had a private pilot, which um, the... NTSB listed as the pilot undergoing instruction and was, I believe, the pilot in command, if I recall correctly, on this flight. And then we had a commercial pilot, glider rated, but also a ground instructor uh, flying. The ages 29 and 60, the flight review for the um, PUI was six months, which was the glider rating check ride. Um, the time in the past year for each of them was 108 for the pilot undergoing instruction, only 27 for the instructor. And both of them had fairly low time in type, uh, 13 and eight hours. They were working, if I recall correctly, on the sportsman aerobatic routine with it. And the club itself had acquired uh, the glider just earlier that year. So this poor club, I don't know which one it was, but you at least in Arizona, you know, did not have this glider for all that long. And 
some of the comments, sustained minor injuries, not injured. They're evaluating sportsman glider sequence, as I mentioned. They slowed and stalled in the inverted position and then increased past 155 knots and it experienced a high frequency elevator flutter with the nose still below the horizon. And during the recovery, the right spoiler deployed and felt the elevator was not controllable. However, they opted to make an emergency landing versus bailout and it did work out fairly well. Um, at this point, because it's preliminary, don't have a lot of photos, but this is what the salvage insurance company has out there. This is not necessarily indicative of the damage from the accident, but you basically can conclude that, you know, this was a total write-off uh, for insurance-wise on it. You know, and each of these, I want to talk about the takeaways for the instructors is here doing aerobatics. Recognize aerobatics does have added risk. It's terrific. Uh, you know, I would love to have an aerobatic glider myself because uh, I do enjoy doing aerobatics and have taught a lot over the years. But not saying it's indicative of this accident, but it just goes to show when you're doing it, you want to be thinking about this is how important briefings are. That is an exchange of controls, covering what if scenarios, how the safety pilot, if you're using one, is going to take over or react to things that don't go wrong. You know, are they gonna wait a while? Are they gonna be on the controls right away? You know, before you go out and do a routine, are you looking at what the errors that could occur in that routine and what the planned recovery is to it? You know, it's the classic, most pilots, it's an innate ability is if the nose uh, necessarily is dropping or whatever, uh, you know, just to haul back hard on the stick, which not always is the right answer. Sometimes a better answer is roll than elevator input, uh, you know, but that all depends upon the situation. And that's why it's so important if you're out doing aerobatics to spend the time on the ground ahead of time. The next one was in Washington, was a L13. Uh, I do think this was, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe this was one of the L13s that was sent back um, to have the AMOC and the AD uh, done over, which it's a bummer to see that it was involved in an accident. It is a final, part 91 personal, L13, as I was saying, non-fatal, injuries none, two on board. Uh, On-scene investigation was done by the FAA, not by the NTSB, and was a collision during landing, specifically in this case. Information, private pilot, age 57, flight review 13 months prior, uh, 38 hours uh, total in gliders, uh, total time, 19 hours in make and model. The second pilot flying private, age 70, Flight review 26 months prior, 692 hours total, and 51 hours in the make and model. You know, what ended up happening is during final, the pilot put the glider in a slip to lose altitude to intercept. Right wing impacted the treetops, came to rest inverted. And this is what it ended up looking like. The NTSB probable cause, Pilot's failure to maintain proper glide path, resulting in a collision. And the NTSB covers um, findings that are associated with the accidents. Here's a few of them here. The takeaways, one of the things that I do as an instructor often with pilots is trying to get them to focus around and pay attention to the bigger picture. Is many times I'll ask them as we're turning on final, what is the highest obstacle? What's the highest point you need to be afraid of or aware of um, on final? Point it out to me, because there are times where literally they can't see the forest for the trees. It is, you know, their vision is so focused in on the runway and so centered, they don't see what's between the runway and them that could have an impact on it. You know, also, this is something to think about, but most of the gliders we're flying are very capable of significant descent with full dive brakes. So you're probably better off, you know, with a steeper approach rather than a shallower approach. 
I know the Soaring Safety Foundation has talked about that in many FERCs and has just had concerns with how shallow the approach slope is for a lot of pilots, especially associated with airspeed when you're looking at total energy with it. It's also important takeaway, if you got two pilots, who's PIC? Make sure that's clear ahead of time. You know, I'm not sure if it was a factor here or not, um, but it is interesting is the FAA report doesn't mention the second pilot at all, but the NTS report does. Uh, you know, it, it's very, very interesting. So if you got two pilots flying, make sure you figure it out ahead of time. Next accident was in November, uh, Waynesville in this ASW-15, this is a similar one, Part 91 personal, non-fatal, injuries minor, on the scene investigation by the FAA only, uh, collision during takeoff and landing, a kind of a um, common theme that we're seeing on these accidents. With it, private pilot, age 70, Flight review was 13 months prior. This is one of those little things I found. It, there is an error in the NTSB report. Um, the NTSB report says one month, but they put the year down wrong uh, on it. If you look at the statements from the pilot that are submitted um, to the NTSB, is you know they put the wrong year in their own report. Uh, so it's actually 13 months, not one month. 75 hours total time, 10 hours in the make and model. Pilot had purchased the aircraft only five months prior. And during the approach, the glider was lower than he initially planned, so he decided to cut the approach short by crossing directly the runway and then turn for landing. During the turn, the glider struck trees and impacted the terrain not mentioned in the FAA report or in the NTSB reports, but is mentioned in the FAA reports is the pilot had stated to the FAA investigator that he may have accidentally deployed the speed brakes earlier, which led them to being low. And, you know, the continuity check was conducted after the accident, no abnormalities, but the speed brakes were found in the up or deployed uh, position. Here. And this ended up, of course, being an insurance claim, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you know, but this is what the aircraft looked like after the fact with some of the damage associated with it. You know, regardless of whether the speed brakes were out or not, you know, it just was an improper approach to landing, which resulted in the collision of the trees. And here's what. Uh, the NTSB had. You know, training, I, I mentioned that highest obstacle on uh, final again uh, to, with it. And also something else to think about, uh, I bring this up, is teaching about landing out more may help. Um, you know, so many of us, it's a natural instinct to be afraid to give up on making it to the home field. Uh, you know, if your club has the opportunity to go out and try different airports, you know, to kind of do a little weekend excursion to another club or something, you know, try to get your pilots, especially the newer pilots in your club, out there and take advantage of it. Because you can, you know, learn to be a pilot at your home airport, but you can't learn to be an aviator at your home airport. You have to experience a lot more than your home airport i.e. you can get a glider rating by only flying at airport ABC, but you're really not going to be a pilot unless you've flown at a whole lot of um, airports. The next one was early in 2020, uh, a tragic accident. Uh, this one did end up being fatal. It's still preliminary. Uh, it was an AC4 Russia and number, as I mentioned, fatal. NTSB and FAA were both on scene uh, on this investigation, which is good, is the pilot was an ATP pilot, age 65. Um, that comes from the FAA data. And many times if you see the asterisk like this, this is information that isn't available in the NTSB report yet. 
uh, but will be, but we have it available in internally in our FAA data. Flight review, I put the question mark here, 18 months, because he had gotten a new type rating just 18 months prior um, to this. However, because this pilot did work as a professional pilot in the airlines, we strongly suspect that he had met the regulatory equivalent of a flight review um, more recently than 18 months. But at this point in time, that's all that we had, but suspect that it was more recent. It was a very, very really recently retired airline pilot. Time and type was only 17 hours. Had gotten their glider rating four and a half hour, four and a half years prior, but had just under a hundred hours in gliders in those four and a half years, although they had 18,000 plus hours in all types of aircraft, uh, including the heavy jets that was flying professionally. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this, I don't know, I'm not an expert on the AC4s and the AC5s, uh, but it caught my attention in relation to this. I always have kind of wondered, and I'll turn the camera on <laughs> in relation to it. I don't know why, uh, maybe it's just me, but the AC4s and the AC5s, as I've seen them on tow, seen them flying, they just seem to sit at a much higher deck angle. I don't know if it's the angle of incidence of how the wing is mounted to the fuselage at all. Um, I, I don't know. It just has this appearance like they they seem to plow through the air more than they do, you know, streamline fly through the air. And, and maybe that's something I had to ask some of the pilots that fly those a bit more. But that definitely catches my attention when I see the AC4s and AC5s out there flying. All right. Some comments from the NTSB. Club member said he helped the pilot assemble the glider um, comprehensive flight control check, which is great. Uh, positive control check. No issues reported in the accident reports. What was interesting is the glider's uh, panel mounted radio was not working. So pilot grabbed a handheld radio, but nobody did hear um, the pilot make any radio calls prior to the accident. And some of the other pilots saw the glider in the traffic pattern uh, when it was on midfield downwind. At this time, another club glider had just executed a practice termination, a tow maneuver from runway 28 to landing opposite direction on one zero. Um, finished landing rollout 10 when looked up. So this actually was, um, and I wasn't there, so I'm not 100% accurate, but. There had been one glider came in, flew the normal pattern, landed. Another glider was taking off and turned around and landed going the other way. So you had two gliders uh, that just landed at the airport as this AC-4 was starting to come in and they had landed opposite directions to each other, if I recall correctly uh, with it. So the airport went from being an exceptionally quiet place to all of a sudden being a very, very busy place. So the pilot with the um, premature termination of tow said they had just finished their landing rollout. I think this was the instructor and saw a white glider in fully developed spin. Did not hear any radio communications, as we mentioned. They found the handheld radio in the storage pouch uh, that was attached to the right side. It exhibited some impact damage to the battery section, but it, it could not be turned on um, with it. And this is what the result was. It was a uh, stall spin. You know, takeaways here, that suddenly busy pattern, how do you deal with it? And think about your students and the other pilots in your club. Have they dealt with it? You know, it, it does happen sometimes. You see it in competitions or whatever else. You know, if a day just all of a sudden shuts down because of an overcast or whatever, you can go from having 10 gliders in the area having a wonderful day to everybody needing to land right now. Um, it was mentioned also within this report, it appeared like they were flying at minimum sync in the pattern. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say positive, negative either way, but I 
at least pose the question to you, what do you think about flying at minimum sink speed in the traffic pattern? You know, the, you definitely see and know people that do that in order to provide more time if needed, not go as far out from the runway, whatever it may be. You know, another discussion item take away from this is radio usage or lack thereof in your club. Is it positive? Is it negative? What, how can it help? How can it hinder? Uh, you know, do you want everybody using radios? Is it an optional thing? Whatever it may be, you know, all of that. This is one of those accidents that it's going to have a lot of things that are good for discussion. This will be a good um, study case for future safety meetings at your club. In early March, we had this accident in Huntsville, Alabama. It is final. It was an instructional accident in L23. Um, Non-fatal, but there were two people on board, a student and instructor, serious injuries for both. The FA was uh, on site for that accident investigation and was labeled as a loss of control in flight. It had a flight instructor glider and a youth student. Um, you don't see much information about the student in the NTSB report because they were a youth um, with it. The flight instructor, age 69, 22 months since flight review, 1,800 hours total, 295 in the make and model, but only 24 hours in the past year. Uh, this was at, I believe, what is it, Moontown uh, down in Alabama. Wind 190 at 11, gust to 18, runway 9 and 27, and they had just swapped. They had been using runway 9 and then swapped to runway 27 uh, here. On it. And this is an interesting one. I, I'll, I'll probably ask Dave to chime in some here too, but it is interesting is the FAA investigation report, not the NTSB one, said that the instructor had completed a level in the wings program uh, recently. But when I dug deep into it, found out that they had only met the knowledge portion, not the flight portion. You know, and it, it's rare. Rarely do we see somebody that has had an accident participating in the WINGS program, especially if they've done it within a year. And you, do you see that, Dave? A lot of people think, oh, I went to a safety seminar, therefore I did WINGS. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in defense of the, the people that do participate in WINGS, it's a little bit complicated sometimes to figure out. That's why your WINGS pros are there. Uh, but just like Steve always encourages, you know, you know, we we watch these webinars, we think about these flying things, but we have to get out and practice those flying skills as well. And uh, that's a really, really big, important part of it. I, I see that a lot. A lot of people have a lot of credits. A lot of instructors have a lot of credits. And they may be doing the flight training, but they're just never quite documenting it. So if it's not there, we we don't know about it. Yeah, that's that's very true. I, you know, I just can't encourage it enough to do something annually. And if you need something, the the wings program is there. But some notes from it: purpose of the flight was to release from tow about 300 feet above ground level, return to the airport in the opposite direction, simulated rope break basically. Uh, with it is once they did it, they did a 270 degree turn on the north side of the runway. Um, you know, and I say that, let's go back and take a look at those winds again. 190 at 11, gust to 18 uh, on the surface. And they made a turn to the north and then had to make a turn another 90 degrees left base to final and retort towards the runway. And it basically was, appears to be a low altitude uh, stall spin entry. And this is what the remnants of the aircraft look like. It hit nose first, very, very hard. Um, you know, maybe about 25% of the accidents that happen out there, I end up having the FISDO or inspectors call me uh, to ask some questions because they don't know gliders as well, that sort of thing. And this is one of them. And, you know, there's positives and negatives. You look at this, you look at this airport and coming off a of runway 27. Why did they turn to the north? Well, it's probably because of the trees and the hill associated with it. But then you gotta think about the increased radius track over the ground if you're doing a simulated rope break 
off of here. You know, and in terms of premature co-termination, you want to think about a lot of different circumstances. And you know, this these fields I'm sure change throughout the year um, with it, but at certain points, they're definitely the fields may be better uh, and at certain times of year that may change uh, better to go and just make a slight turn uh, or 90 degree turn versus trying to make it back to the airport and I bring that up because working as a national resource in gliders for the FAA over the years I got to do a lot of 709 check rides with flight instructors that had in their mind is as long as you're above 200 feet, you can make it back to the airport. That's not the case. That's kind of the minimum altitude in ideal situations. You know, you got to look at the environment you're in, what's happening with the weather, what the performances of your glider, you know, headwind, tailwinds, at what portion it is, all of that with it and that appears to probably be the case here is you know we're doing a practice premature termination of the toe and just not at the right point uh, in relation to the weather conditions and circumstances so the probable cause pilots failure to maintain glider control and its exceedance of critical angle of attack while maneuvering in gusty wind conditions resulting in aerodynamic stall you know, and these findings are there. The takeaways that I would give you uh, with this is take it easy. You know, it's surprising how many accidents and incidents do occur when you have a change in the runway direction at glider ports. You know, it, it becomes a stressful time. You know, everybody's moving around, equipment's moving, all of that is you know, it can happen in the real world, definitely, but do you want to make it even more challenging by doing something like a premature termination of toe on your first launch with changing the runway direction? Uh, you know, I talked a little bit about the 200 foot classic rope break with it. And the last thing to emphasize here, which is very true, uh, all of us have lived it, Dave still lives it day in, day out, is for flight instructors is risk management you know not only do you have to teach risk management but you have to be really darn good at risk management because you need to manage the instructional environment which is much much higher than all of the other you know type of flying that you might end up doing is flight instruction has hazards it is risky you got to manage those hazards as best as you possibly can to keep the environment safe for you and safe for your students. So, you know, and I think we'll see it in the airplane world first, but I think in the new ACS for the flight instructor airplane, you're going to see a whole new section in the ACS on just that is managing the risk associated with the instructional environment. Groveland, Florida. In April, the standard Cirrus, this one was a fatal one. It was on scene by the FAA, but I just note the date. If you take a look, this is when we kind of really first started dealing with the COVID era. And as a result, I think you'll see less of the FAA and the NTSB on site for rest of the year <laughs> after that. Fairly new private pilot, um, airplane single engine land private pilot in October. Uh, 2019 uh, glider rating added just a month later. You'll see the double asterisk there because in our FAA records, um, it kind of indicates that, but there's some stuff with the medical records and, and other records that don't align. I think it probably more is just typographical errors or something. Uh, the NTSB will do a terrific job in ferreting that out. Age 58, the flight review, of course, was just a few months earlier, uh, which was the check ride itself. Time and type was just 20 hours. Um, total time, the person had gotten a medical certificate back in October 2012, and it was listed as 110 hours total time at that time. 
However, on the glider check ride, they list it as just a total flight time of 90 hours, 80 hours in airplanes, 10 hours in uh, gliders, and had purchased the aircraft just back in November 2019, so it was a fairly new glider to them. While climbing out, this is from the tow pilot, 500 feet, hit some turbulence, you know, at that time felt the glider release. He continued straight out thinking a rope break and then described watching the glider release from tow at low altitude and turn east. And this is other witnesses. They described the turn continuing to the south and then the nose of the glider point down as it descended vertically. And you know, what is interesting is another pilot had flown it recently in a competition just before I think the seniors and the glider was not disassembled but had been kept hangered fully assembled there and flight control checks had been performed and certified on the glider, you know, prior to it. Uh, that's probably signing the tape as you see at a lot of those. So, you know, we have reason to suspect that it appears at least initially the controls were all pretty good. Now, I don't have any um, pictures from the accident, but here's something that'll give you just a little bit of a idea. And think about this, if you were flying and this were to happen to you at low altitude. Short little video. You can take a look. At, this is the title of the video on YouTube, and it's about six minutes and 12 seconds in. You can see what it is entering a spin in a standard Cirrus and what it looks like. And I just would emphasize, maybe take a look at what that looks like um, and think about that happening down at low altitude. May, we had this accident in Arlington, Washington. This is the sister ship to it here, or L20 or L33, excuse me. Minor injuries, FA was on scene, loss of list, lift. Um, commercial pilot, but working on adding a glider rating, so student in glider. Flight review was 23 months prior, 4,500 hours total, but only had four hours make and model. And this was their first aircraft in the glider in um, solo in two months in the L33 and had just soloed gliders back in February 2020. This happened in May, uh, so it was right near the 90-day limit on their solo endorsement, I would assume. And then the L33 was signed off for solo flight in March. Is unable to reach the runway, diverted to a gravel area to land out. Okay, Dude, happy there <laughs> during the landing road. Heard a loud bang that was later identified as a pothole. And you know, is kind of a poor situation to get yourself low. Recognized it though, didn't force it, didn't hit trees, that sort of stuff. Chose probably what was the best place to put it down. And then, you know, bad luck of hitting a pothole. The, the damage was to the fuselage. You see the wrinkling here and everything you know and this is a direct quote from them in the ntsb report is you know what they would recommend is if the altitude situation is deteriorating don't over focus on what you want to happen look around for a better landing alternative you know i was taught this but maybe someone else might benefit knowing i over focused on the path and i was uh, rather than altering to a safe field that was within gliding distance. You know, and the FAA report uh, had kind of talked about, really was focusing too much on trying to fly a good traffic pattern with a good base leg and final versus um, turning directly to the runway, got caught in some sink, you know, was too slow, too low type of thing. And, you know, ended up sacrificing, you know, what was thinking was a good pattern base to final, downwind to base, and ended up, you know, having to put it out and breaking the airplane uh, as a result. Some of the takeaways uh, with this is student oversight. You know, it's helpful to have a pre-flight review with them ahead of time, weather conditions, what you're doing, where you're going. 
or whatever, you know, and I mention it as an instructor, just because you think you've told them a hundred times, it, that's kind of rare, more so really what has happened as an instructor is you've told a hundred students one time. Uh, so, you know, you need to review stuff over and over and over again with students, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, in most gliders, you're better off being a little bit high and having to pull full dive brakes than to get low. You know, you'll hear it described as a max effort landing. And even there are some countries where that is a focus on how the final should be flown. Texas in June, we had this accident. It's final, personal in the Mosquito, non-fatal, no injuries. On scene, uh, nobody from the FAA, loss of control on the ground. Nobody from the FAA or NTSB, excuse me. Private glider, 65, 14 months since flight review, 470, 211 in make and model. You know, ended up in weakening conditions on short final. Notice that the turf runway at the private airport had not been mowed recently. Long grass blocking view, unable to maintain directional control and impacted a fence. You know, pilot had used the airport before twice and had, had helped on other retrievals there too. You know, so it's kind of hard. You can't, given the conditions, you can't blame the pilot, but this is one of the things with out landings is sometimes it's hard to tell exactly what you're going to get into until you get so low that you're pretty much already committed. Uh, so damage you can see here from these uh, two pictures on it. Probable cause to divert to the private airport, maintain directional control while landing on a turf runway that contained tall grass. Some of the findings, you know, it's good to review if you're going cross country, how to determine field conditions comparison. That's always a terrific view every or review on your safety outreach at your clubs. You know, sometimes you have a decision that results in an outlanding that is executed well, but the terrain at the last minute, you know, it outlanding something to really think about and tall grass can have an impact on this, but be very, very careful of dragging a wing or bank at angle at low altitudes. And, you know, this is just another example of why it's good to practice the off airport landings, you know, going to a different airport if your club does that. I cannot emphasize that enough is giving experience at other airports and getting your club members to see something different than your home airport is very, very helpful. Uh, tragic accident in July in Nevada, it's preliminary. Um, ASW 2718, otherwise known as an ASG 29. Nobody is on scene on this one. Um, ATP, but private glider rating, age 73, flight review unknown, time and type unknown. This one's really such, we don't know much about it at, at this point in time, but here's some of the stuff that is listed in the preliminary. This is one we don't know a whole lot other than what you already see in the preliminary. Midlothian, Texas in late July. Uh, this was an instructional accident, a Grobe 102, minor injuries. Commercial pilot, but adding on a glider rating, age 61, flight review unknown. Was doing a solo flight for the add-on rating. Um, the planned flight, they delayed it due to higher winds earlier in the day, which was terrific. Um, they had done four flights with the instructor in the prior day, um, planning for this. And the instructor was supervising and witnessed the hard, fast landing. You know, and I, I bring this up as to date, this is something to think about with all these kind of boo-boos, busted little airplanes in our clubs, that sort of thing, is things like this may end up leading to people not liking soaring is, I don't know if this is the case, but I do know this student still has not achieved their rating, nor do I know if they plan to. And that's something we need to think about is what is the impact 
if we have someone that has an accident or incident. You know, we lose that person that may enjoy the sport, but we're losing an airframe. We're probably even bringing a negative connotation in about glider flying spreading to the rest of the world. That's why, you know, the instructional supervision is so important. And I'm not saying it's this case, the case here in this event, but we have had so many of these uh, over the years. You know, the one we saw earlier with the L33, that person has achieved their rating, which is terrific. You know, if the student isn't ready to solo uh, and you're not completely, completely comfortable and, and see that they are ready to solo, don't don't send them. You know, that you don't want that hanging over you, your club. Or, or whatever else. I mean, probably I have a personal story and probably all of us do with that. Continuing on, Warner Springs, we're getting near the end here, 233, non-fatal, student, age 18, solo endorsement, time and type. This person has gotten their private glider since, and then airplane add-on rating too, I do believe. But basically, when chasing a cloud, got too far away from the airport with a 233, made an off airport landing um, with it, and it just ended up being enough damage to qualify as an accident. You know, I'm going to go back one is a good thing as instructors to do is review the fields close to your airport. Have you walked them yourselves? Have you walked them with students? You know, it, the it, experience has shown us it's more when than if someone will end up just short of the airport. And if they know where some of the better places are, that's good. Some other things to think about is, you know, the goal approached oriented landing. Um, you know, if they're getting a little bit low, what are the ways that they can make it directly to the airport, um, you know, and have extra altitude to be able to work with with that? And that's something you may want to think about. Union, Illinois, in September, at the very end of the year, we had a collision between two gliders. It was a Part 91 flight and an instructional flight. Um, two gliders here, a PIC. 20D and a 233. That is not that is the glider, but not for sale right now at that price. That is actually from an old ad in Soaring magazine uh, that had that very glider listed, and that was the price at that time for the glider. And the FA was on scene. As I mentioned, it was a collision on the launch. Private pilot, age 43, three months since flight review. Glider flipped and crashed, hitting the other one. And pretty much anybody could have stopped this, but didn't. And they continued on, and the two colliders collided. And it's important to think about having your ground crew available there. And, you know, it's a team event on the ground. You know, you're usually flying solo in the air, but not on the ground. You're working in a crew environment. And it is events like this that. Uh, really probably do end up being a wake-up call for a club. You know, I, I would strongly suspect that there's a lot of review, what they were doing, how they were doing it, and a lot of retraining going on with their members and focus on it. The bad thing is it probably took an event like this to make all of that happen. And, you know, you don't have to take off quickly <laughs> is a takeaway I would, I would give you. You know, we always are getting pushed or focused on getting in the air but you know you're much better off being on the ground making sure everything is right than you are being in the air wishing you were on the ground that kind of classic old thing right at the end of the year we had a ASK21 in Hinkley uh, non-fatal who FA was on scene hard landing Private pilot, age 72, 17 months since flight review. Uh, wings, actually, that was how they completed it. One of the very few people uh, that we see in accidents that had completed it, but had done it 17 months before. If, as Dave would attest, if he could have done it in the past 12 months, I'd be a lot happier person. He probably would be, and you know, a high chance we wouldn't even have a, a bent airplane or bent glider. Excuse me. 130, 130 hours of gliders, 76 in the type. 
and you know it was a pattern toe flared late bounced what the pilot said and pretty much if you read the description from the pilot it's kind of you may have seen this um screenshot before of uh, k21 bouncing around um on the runway from a youtube video but this is kind of at this moment is what the pilot was describing and you know this is a good point takeaways here is as instructors have you been instructed in student errors and know when to take control are you able to teach or recover from an error you know and before your student has gone solo have they experienced recovery from a botched landing you know really good students may not have seen it had many or had the chance to correct themselves and it kind of is a necessary skill uh, as you can't normally go around. Doesn't mean you want to do stuff that will hurt the airplane, but especially as instructors, you need to see what it's like and learn how to recover from it. And probably not that you would go out to teach it, but see that the pilot has started to develop the necessary skills to start to work out of a botched landing to make it better. So like I said, you know, there's just so, so much information here. I We're going to do tow planes and motor gliders in another presentation here uh, sometime in the near future. We got all the information together. We just have to set up and decide on the date and the time on it. And I want to emphasize here that safety is more than just not having an accident because we see incidences that are not accidents but maybe implicating safety and always things that you want to discuss you know motor gliders landing gear up you know landing out many times it may be a very good experience all you have to do is take the glider apart it makes for an interesting day but you also want to discuss how did you get there um you know you don't want it to be a big deal but was it because maybe people were being too aggressive and stretching the glide? Why did it happen? What could you do differently? You know, landing out is much better than ending up in the trees, but you you know, something has happened ahead of time that you may want to adjust to keep that from happening uh, and to minimize the amount that it happens. And even landing out in different places uh, can occur. You know, we see this every year or two. Uh, I had this sort of thing happen this past year again. And, you know, Wings and Wheels was talking about non-accidents, just ground operations and sad stories and insurance claims like this. You know, the ground operations not being done right or challenges can cost us. So, you know, you always wonder how close are you to having an accident? And even if you're really trying, are you really doing it right to be safe? And, you know, I point out here, the Soaring Safety Foundation has their safety points here, which pretty much match up with what we find looking at the accidents from the FAST team also. You know, definitely are, are all solid, solid points to improve the safety in your operation and think about, you know, and from the FAST team, when we look at the accidents, here's a lot of things that you want to be thinking about, you know, things like taking it easy the first 25 hours, you know, decide early if you're landing out. They do have some surprises, but you're much better off deciding early uh, than you are trying to stretch the glide, you know, always fly the aircraft all the time. Don't rush. You know, and we all do look for all of us here that are joined tonight and thank you for promoting educate and improving aviation. And, you know, we have a whole lot of things that are available out there for you. Uh, here with the New England FAST team, we do a webinar on the last Tuesday of every month with that. Here's a few videos that can help you with the FAA Wings program if you are interested in it. Um, I think Dave, you one or two of these are from you. The instructor portal one is from me, right? Are these ringing a bell yeah, to the, you, Dave? Yep, the second one right there is uh, one of the things you can do when you get these, you know, if you want to use uh, your your work or your time in watching a webinar like this is when that webinar comes through to you it's going to tell you exactly what type of credit you're going to get for it whether it's basic advanced or master and whether it's a one two or three so this video here in the middle kind of shows you when you complete a course 
where the, what the credits mean, where they go. It's about nine minutes long, and it's something you can go in and just review from time to time, but that pretty much gives you everything that you need to do to go ahead and get into and using the program. Yep, and the bottom one is for me. Um, the top one is a broad one, but the bottom one is for me. It's just a quick review to show you how as an instructor you can give credits, and it's real easy. You don't even have to log into your account as an instructor in order to give WINGS credits. You can sit down and do it in just about 30 seconds is all that it takes. Uh, you know, you watch the video, and you'll end up finding out that the video is way longer than it ever would take you to do it just because we drag you through it slowly to make sure you understand. So we do want to thank you, the New England Fast Team, FPMs, and Dave here for helping us uh, this evening. I do hope that you did enjoy this. Please, please, please download the uh, notes for this. Also, please join us when we cover the tow planes and motor gliders here. Here is our contact information if you do want to reach us. And um, you know, we'll stick around a little bit here to answer questions, but no need for you to stick around is you will get credit for joining us through to this point.